everyone for being here. We're really excited today. Uh, we're going to have two speakers uh, for our brown bag event series. Um, the first one here is Anthony Jones. He's from the Federal Highway Administration here in Austin. Um, he's going to be talking to us about planning for livability and community connection. So I'll let you go ahead. Yes. Uh, like you said, Anthony Jones, Federal Highway. Um, I work in the planning department there. Uh, I am technically, I'm not going to say expert, but been working towards it uh, for livability and community connections, and then also do uh, planning and stewardship and oversight for metropolitan planning organizations. Uh, my areas are Abilene, Amarillo, Beaumont, and the city of Corpus Christi. Um, and so within the past three years, I've come to know this project of Harbor Bridge. Um, it's basically a, a redesign and rebuild of the current bridge that they put down in like 1963. Um, the plan is to, of course, improve it for safety and design reasons, and then also to allow better flow for a uh, larger tanker and freight ships to come through um, into the Port of Christ, uh, Corpus Christi. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's going to, as you can see, it does about six lanes. Um, it'll add three lanes in each direction, has a medium bar barrier, uh, shoulders, bicycles, and pedestrian lanes that connect Port Aransas on the north and the city of Corpus Christi downtown. Uh, additionally, probably about 1.6 miles off of I-37. So it's a, a major thoroughfare for uh, regional trade and freight within the area. Uh, yeah. And through our FIE, no, excuse me, FEIS, um, there were five recommended uh, alignments. TxDOT decided to go with the red alignment um, to show that to provide better access to I-37 and to open up a little bit more of the Washington Coles area that is south to east of the bridge. Um, with that, it also caused a little issues. Um, but here's basically what it's gonna look like now. Um, sorry, I should've did this before. I hate standing up. This is the old alignment of where how everything connects. This is the new alignment, which is the red, it goes definitely from North Beach all the way down to this new interchange right here. And as you can tell, this is our study area of Hillcrest and Washington Coles neighborhoods. Uh, so what it's going to do, as you can tell, I-37 and 181, it definitely segregated and separated the community from downtown, not providing any access to it at all. Um, closing off any major thoroughfares with the interstate being built through. And so most of its access are some of overpasses and the main thoroughfares here and here. Um, and with the building of this bridge, we have some issues uh, that it came through. It's a Title VI EJ complaint. Um, civil rights is the Title VI complaint. Uh, it's saying that uh, that has text dot uh, was discriminated against the Hillcrest neighborhood by not taking into consideration the increased air pollution, noise impact, increased isolation, and decrease in property values the bridge project uh, will bring upon this African-American community. Um, so also, all of the Port of Corpus Christi has surrounded. Uh, since 1963. And so when we accepted the complaint, um, it was based on the allegation that the proposed construction of the recommended red line uh, would result in a desperate impact on the community. Uh, and since then, it, it definitely has, because although the bridge is elevated several stories higher than a, the original, uh, it opens up some access 
but it will still cut off the community and they still won't have as much access and mobility to the downtown areas to reach jobs, groceries, and things like that. Um, uh, just a little context about the community. Uh, it's an historic African-American Hispanic community uh, that has endured 50 plus years of redlining, uh, disinvestment, and segregation. Uh, and so with that, I have a couple population stats of 3,105 3, residents in 2010. In 2010, there is a population decrease of 2,000, well, 2,972. That's probably about a 3.3%. Um, but there's a voluntary relocation program that has been implemented as part of one of our mitigation efforts, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. And after that, there's gonna be approximately be about 130 residents left in this community. So you can tell that by the impact of this bridge here, it's definitely desperate. And it's impacted the community to the degree that it is removing them from vital sources, such as jobs, schools, because buying the alignment within the area has taken away many of the schools and the offices within the community and businesses. All right, and so in order to get, to rectify these issues, uh, we took the opportunity with the community and TxDOT to create a citizen advisory committee, um, which is made up of the representatives from Washington Cole and Hillcrest. Uh, we did this about in 2009. And then in speaking with them, they wanted to have a plan for their community as they come back and thrive um, to make it once as good as it could be or even better. Uh, so we decided to just make a livability plan, which would you know promote and revitalize the area. And it's all community-based. You know, we have several meetings to discuss this at all times. Uh, when the Title VI complaint came through, we had to go back and do a voluntary resolution agreement with TxDOT, uh, the City of Corpus Christi, the City of Corpus Christi uh, Port Authority, and then also between Federal Highways and FTA, because we are the federal agencies that helped out. Uh, As another result from the VRA, we gave the text that gave the residents the opportunity in order to be voluntary uh, involved in an acquisition program um, that has taken place for now for about three years. Uh, it ended in May, uh, but this acquisition program was to basically give the community residents the opportunity to move to better housing locations within the city of Corpus Christi. Uh, we gave them comparable and safe, decent housing, uh, which was 10 times probably better than what they've already had. The housing stock that was in the community was 50 plus years old, uh, run down since it was low income. And so many of them decided that they wanted to leave uh, the community. And then also some of the tenants that were living in the area as well uh, were living in squalor because of slum landlords and to that nature. So they had also the opportunities to, you know, take part of this. All right. So currently with the acquisitions as of the ninth of, excuse me, there has been about 413 uh, interested in the program. Uh, as you can tell, 391 have been confirmed eligible. Uh, 341 appraisals have been completed. Uh, 320 have been offered the money and then also the relocation package. Uh, 280 have accepted it. Uh, as, as of now, as of then, 257 have closed and about 27 people have rejected it. And so these 27 people, they probably declined because uh, they wanted to stay within the community. Um, they wanted it because they have strong ties, 
mostly everyone in that area is currently probably 55 and older. And so they have strong ties of what it used to be and the connection is still there. Um, and so about 103 parcels uh, did not participate altogether because of the 27 who declined and then 54 who did not opt into it. And then also the 22 that weren't eligible for the program at all. So, so this kind of goes into how I started to think about the livability plan because with about 130 people that's going to remain in this community, you know, as you can tell, this is the patchwork of the acquired and the demolished buildings that they have. And so there's going to be a lack of community, um, a lack of almost to a degree, a loss of identity to, a, to that degree, because all of these houses here, there's probably three or four people that live on that block. My neighbor is already gone. What am I going to do left? Um, how am I going to be able to live within this current state of my community and then to propose what we're trying to do right now? And so we've been coming up with ideas in order to, you know, help them out. Uh, so you, utilizing our livability principles of providing more transportation choices, such as bike and pedestrians, transit access and mobility, um, improved streets, uh, helping them access, what is these things? Access uh, more economic and thriving atmospheres. We've been able to do, you know, to lead this off. Um, and we also want to promote equitable and affordable housing because with many of them gone, uh, the VRA program has stipulated that unfortunately the houses that have been acquired that they can no longer turn into residences that they must be light industrial and so now that they've been owned by the port we're trying to take care of the housing that is left um, which is not up to par and so we're trying to find loans um, for housing programs working with this corpus city uh, city of corpus christi housing authority in order for them to you know revitalize their homes that they're currently in um, mostly roofs are bad, kind of leaking. Uh, also the pipes and stuff are not working. So trying to get that out. Um, and we also want to enhance the economic competitiveness of the area as well. Uh, because with the business that moved out, it has taken a lot. Um, I know currently there are three thriving businesses. One is a funeral home. That was a beauty supply store. And the last is, what was that? I think an automobile shop. And so with those three integral businesses that are left in there, they really don't have too many customers that's gonna come through. So we're trying to make a plan for them to be able to thrive and reconnect with the outside communities that they're um, and supporting existing communities, which is key. Uh, again, target, particularly like transit oriented developments, there's plans to put in uh, increased bus rapid transit or bus stops within the southern portion all along Washington Coles and the Port Avenue because uh, there is a what is that I think it's a HEB that's close by but it's on the opposite side and so hopefully we can get that taken care of and put through within the plans and then we want to also coordinate and leverage our federal policies and investments utilizing innovative finance uh, TIFs, anything that can boost and create funding opportunities for the area. So I've been contacting and working with uh, the MPO down there to see what they have. And then also with our headquarters to see if they can come through with build money. Um, what is that? And Tiger funding as well to help out with the transit projects out there. Uh, and the values in communities. It's just basically to ensure that it's a walkable and safe area in their neighborhood for them and then also their visitors. Um, this rendering right here is actually one of the renderings that TxDOT has set out for a, uh, what do you call that? It is a hike 
and bike trailhead that's going to connect the community to the North Beach because it'll ride over into the Bethesda. All right. Um, another thing that was community connections is to basically invest in the community, uh, renew it, restore it, and repair it. Um, all aspects of leveraging the opportunities that are there, uh, what they have and what they've got. I mean, this is a very rambunctious and determined bunch of people that are left in that community. Um, they have every meeting that we have been to voiced it very actively. Um, they have even called out the, the city for not investing in them anymore. So being able to advocate on your own behalf is a strong thing. Um, and with my good backing, I hope to keep that going as well. Um, and then just to renew old infrastructure that's not key anymore. So the major one is the New Harbor Bridge that they're getting ready to put through. And then also the street grid connections that they have currently within our community. Uh, and restoring, hopefully, the neighborhood to a decent, livable community in which they can thrive in. And then also repairing some of the old mitigation efforts and the injustices that were placed upon this community, unfortunately. Well, not unfortunately. That was done purposely at the times. All right. Uh, the mobility and access. Uh, the removal of the Harbor Bridge and with the new uh, highway alignment, it should bring back the transfer, uh, transportation infrastructure that uh, would bring back the grid for the local streets, uh, as well as providing more access for vehicles and mobility uh, within the region. Uh, another thing is the connectivity of the local street grid between the neighborhood and also connecting them back downtown which is going to be a key. Uh, implement, implementation of bikes and pedestrian paths throughout the neighborhood and then also along the, the bridge alignment. Um, the earlier picture showed that here's the hiking bike trail here. It'll wrap around here and then also go up across. All right, so our current progress, um, there's been seven livability committee meetings uh, where everybody's came and sp basically spoke their mind. Uh, one stakeholder livability draft plan review and comment session uh, that was between Federal Highway, FTA, and then also TxDOT. And then once we provided our comments back to TxDOT, they went out to the community again in order to have two reading sessions so that they can put their input on it and then understand how the plan is going to go forth as well. Um, we have one more review session coming up in November, and then hopefully by January 2020, the plan should be done. Um, if not, I'm going to send it back and tell them they need to redo it again. But it's pretty nice. Uh, here's a couple of resources and links on community connections and livability, and then also on the Harbor Bread project itself. Uh, so if you want to talk about it, let's, let's go now. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yes. So the bridge is a nineteen twenty-five Epic Chevrolet or just so it is being constructed and maintained by TechStock. Um they've hired out to a consultant, uh construction firm, I think H E M B T. And I do believe the project is supposed to be done within the next four years. Mm -hmm. um, you said that most of these people are uh, like opting into relocating. Do we know like where they're going? Are they staying in Corpus Christi or are they going like far outside other parts of Texas? Okay. So many of them that have opted into the program are staying within Corpus Christi. Uh, and some have probably went to like Port Aransas, just within the vicinity. Uh, there has been a couple that have moved outside the state, but they moved for like family and friends. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, we haven't kept too much tabs on those that have gone like out of state. Uh, all of the the relocation efforts, they bought housing within the Corpus area. Oh, okay. Yeah. So to participate, you need to stay in the area. Yeah. And to 
follow up on that, the packages that were offered, are they kind of all over the city or will the community be able to stay somewhere close? They are actually all over the city. All over the city, okay. Yeah, and so people had the choice of, you know, choosing their own housing that was a comparable rate. Um, with the relocation package, they had to either go through the, the acquisition process of having it inspected to that degree in nature, but many of them sometimes couldn't find housing that was comparable. Mm -hmm. And so they actually decided to go without the inspection. Um, so it kind of it kind of hurt them in the long run, but a lot of them are now house owner, house housing owners, and no longer tenants. So that makes out for a good thing for them. Yeah. Okay. Anthony, just to uh, make sure I'm saying that uh, you said that after poor uh, takes over the parcels, mm -hmm. and there will be no residential. So, right. Uh, so the. The housing that has been acquired by the port has been turned into light industrial. Then in that case, then uh, how will the idea of the transit-oriented development be? And so, it is supposed to take place on the, the southeastern side, on the other side of where Washington Coles and downtown connects. Um, not, not, uh, exactly. No, not in the the northern Hillcrest portion. Yeah, because the city of Corpus has also put within their uh, master plan of economic development, mixed use housing on that Washington Coles uh, North Beach entertainment area uh, to kind of revitalize that at the same time, because you know that area also has the the aquarium, uh, as well as the naval ship and the the baseball stadium, so those are not being too much impacted. It's just the the north side communities on the northern side of the bridge that's been heavily impacted by it all. And then the, the land currently, the old bridge, or the currently the, uh, the bridge is uh, mm -hmm. uh, on, and the land will, will give me all the. To the city so, or, or yes, the city. It, is, it shall be returned to the city. Um, so that whole I-37 south and that alignment around, they're supposed to deconstruct it all and let the city make plans for it. Okay. Yeah. And so also one thing I didn't mention is that there's been so much investment by the city currently to involve the livability plan for their next uh, redevelopment effort and master planning. And so the next one is supposed to be in, well, it is October, I was about to say, <laughs> oh, but it's supposed to take place now. And so they're gonna implement a lot of our initiatives to plan for the area. Like, what is it? What is if it's like a raised bridge? How is it preventing that? So, how does it one is that many of the streets they're going to be closed. Um, so that's going to be limiting the access. Now, there's only they're going to keep two major thoroughfares to go through. Um, and then, what else? So the bridge is connecting to a major highway that's also being added right. in. So the major so, highway is the thing that's cutting off. So I-37 is already there. Oh, okay. Um, the, the intersection right there is already complete. They're just going to connect the new alignment into there and close off some of the access streets that have been once flowable. And so the two main ones are going to go underneath the pillars. The rest of them is going to, at that slope ramp, be shut off. So it's going to it's going to hurt them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the, the noise and just the you know concrete Pollution. everywhere, and right? Pollution. And and then just based looking at that map, has there been any argument that 
that neighborhood's already like in the flood zone anyway, so it might make sense to relocate those people. So, especially with that area and climate change, it seems like there's a lot of volatility. I know. Um, so, to, really, Hillcrest is, is by its name, it sits on a hill oh, okay. that is above the uh, flood region. Now, sitting and speaking with some of the community um, and the residents that come to the, the livability meeting, there has been instances of flooding and water pooling within the neighborhood that never happened before. And it has started to occur with the building and the construction of this bridge. Um, mostly because of all the debris and everything that gets swept into the sewers and it's not cleaned out in a quick enough time, so it starts to flood and flood. Um, there are going to be some stormwater uh, mitigation efforts. Uh, I wish I had a pointer. Uh, just a little bit north around this area here because there's a, a drainage and sewer system that floods out. And so, yeah, that'd be addressed as well. So moving people north, is that even further out of the flood zone? Like relocating people to those other neighborhoods, is that even, is that like even further out of the flood zone? Or uh, so technically if knowing the corpus area, if you move them more northwest, It'll be out of a flood zone, but that's technically not in the flood zone. Right. Yeah. Is it the old bridge uh, that we're staying uh, after the new bridge, uh, the complete bridge? It's just like uh, the uh, Boston, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Keep that uh, not for vehicle access, but still a linkage between the two sides of the harbor. Right now, and mm. we're, we're, well, I know, well, as I know now, I do believe that they're going to demolish that bridge. They're going to demolish this whole old alignment. Um, with the new bridge, it's going to include a biking path going all the way across. The old bridge is going to be number five because it was going to be for the companionship. Oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. Also, because the old time is going to go because both of the bridges are all kinds of changes. Yeah. Oh, so that's and then the tunnel oil pipelines are coming there, so essentially, and, and of course, like the, the new pipeline being built in Texas is going to be natural gas, so the natural gas is pretty big. It's just not high enough for, for the clearance. And, and yeah. If you're going to build a new bridge, you should be high. You would get, want to get rid of it, but it's also right at the point at which the ships are not going in there really narrows down and you don't. So you really, you can really see how it narrows in at that point. Mm -hmm. And probably at that time, they're going to dredge, I'd imagine, because look at the core of dredging shows that it's probably low dredging projects for line yeah. the so the streamlining the, uh, the bridge is not, it's not the only one motivation, right? Because uh, allowing other ships for... It's so the, the streamlining of the bridge and mobility and then also the, the economic development for the region is key. If you overlaid this map with all the pipelines that come into the port of Corpus Christi, I mean, one, your mind would be blown, maybe. Um, yeah. But secondly, it's a huge economic driver for the U.S. Corporate. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to be. And you've also got second like, largest. Because the Gulf is the coastal waterway here. There's all the barge traffic that's coming yeah. up, and there's still barge traffic that's headed down right into this area. So exactly, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge economic driver. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just really sad. I can ask you a zillion questions, but they're all political. Um, it's just, right. it's extremely sad. An entire community has just been. It's, it's almost so in like terms of a kind of keeping blueprint, it's not just this way, east, west, on the end, but also like north, the, south, and as far as the water. Yeah. That's yeah. even more uh, kind of important in terms of uh, economic development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, no, I mean, the ports hire a lot of people, so and they right, hire right. people at really good paying jobs. And yeah, that makes sense. Business. Otherwise, we say, well, yeah. <laughs> there are yeah, yeah. yeah. many dollars just for streamlining. You have you have to think of so think about when you went on a cruise ship. If you go if you watch the Love Boat thing, T V show from the seventies, <laughs> which I watch every Sunday for a little bit of seventies nostalgia, mm. and you look and I've been on a Love Boat and you look at how small that cruise ship was and you look at what's on the sea now, everything's been exponentially maxed. If you look at container ships, mm -hmm. growth, growth, growth. If you look at the ships that are hauling crude oil, growth up. 
So right. the whole industry has grown. So it's and, particularly and with. Every, uh, so yeah, so it's it's that's probably the fundamental initial driver. But then there are so many other drivers that tap into it once you start down that route because you have the economic development, and as you said. They're probably going to put some sort of tip in here at some point, or mm -hmm. special assessment, or there's going to be something that's going to generate revenue. And if the port can make, port owner can make it work. I just have one final question. So, for the remaining residents of there, um, if they say that, so, but from our perspective, we own our homes. The idea is that when we pass along, it either goes to our children or it gets donated to charity. So, what will happen to those properties? Is there something that's going to go into the people's rules that they'll get something so, that will be passed down to the next generation? Because okay. otherwise you've lost intergenerational equity in this. Generation. Correct, correct. Um, so the thing is, those that are left and didn't participate in the VRP, they're on their own. They're on their own. Yes. Now, um, many have kind of put out their bets that the port will come in and buy up the rest. So they're hoping, exactly. So they might be hedging their bets for that. And now after a while, we're trying to set up the plan in a short, medium and long terms, just to see how it all can play out with scenarios. Uh, like I said, between eminent domain, uh, the port's coming in to buy the housing, you know, for a little bit more for what the VRA did or the people just die out and move on. Um, so it it's really up to them on how I can get fixed and taken care of. And, it, yeah. and so hopefully they take that equity and put it somewhere else. I mean, they, yeah. But it's, it's definitely disheartening when you go and you sit and you talk with them and they're like, well, such and such been here for 50 years and now she's moved on and I'm the only one left. And you're hearing stories about, they turned the lights off on the street. How can you fix this? Uh, what's the, what's the cause? Um, I mean, if nobody lives on that city block but one person, the city is like, well, fortunately I might need it to save a little bit of funding. And so um, it's those things that this livability plan is trying to build upon is something that's comprehensive and actionable, giving them resources throughout the community to be able to advocate for themselves and know who to go to within the city of Corpus that they can speak with. Um, and so that's a, another portion of like the resource uh, along with determining what the housing and stock is going to look like, how they can improve what they have currently, uh, the economic development portion of it with the businesses there that are left, how are they going to thrive, you know? So yeah. it's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting, mm -hmm. especially considering like the history of the way that like low income black and brown communities have been sort of torn up by some of these bigger yes. highway projects. It's really interesting to think about it in today's context. And so mm -hmm. like, Sharing that. Yeah. Um, just in the sake of time, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, unless there's any last questions. Um, I know in relation to that and what you just said, mm -hmm. I've actually just finished reading Color of the Law, oh, okay. which is a good book. So if y'all haven't, you need to read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Color. Yeah, Color. Yeah. Uh, we did, yes. We'll put that up um, while we're putting it up. And I get to see you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Uh, so our next speaker is going to be Lisa off the spot way. So I don't know if you all met, but Lisa was the CPR of the Center for Transportation Research here at UC. So good afternoon, everyone, and I kind of feel I might follow a little bit about you because this project we did actually 
one, we hit many hurdles, and two, we, we were really trying to think about um, EJ and equity in this. So, but my year three's project was looking at um, resiliency and looking at how and where and why and should MPOs be involved in mega regional resiliency or part of the solution. And so, um, it's a one-year project, and these are my, my collaborators in chief, Paulina and Roxanne. They are both fully employed adults now in the big wide world. So, um, and we are slow, slowly, slowly wrapping this project up, writing the final report, etc. So the genesis of this idea came out of the previous year's work that was looking at MPOs and, and again, looking at how they could be involved in mega regional planning. Um, and as this was going on, we were just hit by so many seminal weather disaster events globally. I'm going to say they're because of climate change. I can be political. I'm allowed to be that. I'm going to say that. Or global warming. Take it what you will. I did a master's in environmental law. Um, and what I learned 20 years ago at the University of Nottingham is happening here and now from all the experts my law professors brought in to teach us in the different segments. And so when we, as these, all these things were going on, wildflowers, you know, torrential rains over Houston, you know, the flooding that occurred in the Louisiana area, storms in the Northeast, and obviously after Hurricane Sandy in the Northeast, and then just, you know, the devastation in California, and then of course we really saw the devastation last year with an entire town in California destroyed by wildflower. And there actually was a TV show on HGTV about that community with a couple who were restoring homes. So it was like a house flipping show. And I wondered what happened to that couple because this was their whole livelihood. And they were a very young couple and they were biracial, but they were putting equity in the community and psh, community's gone. So anyway, so that was going on. And then the FAST Act started to integrate resiliency into our federal laws requiring the DOTs and the MPOs and the US DOT and Federal Highway to start thinking about resiliency. So it was sort of all these things were happening. So that's why we decided to do this project. And again, this was a map that Paulina put together. And so we were looking at these sort of specific types of storms and just how much you know, money they are costing us um, in billions of dollars. So we're talking huge amounts of money. And I don't know if you guys have been watching this week, but I mean, Japan has been devastated by that typhoon. I mean, absolutely devastated. Um, and the way that storm sat, the eye was tiny. So the South Island of Japan was just drenched and now it's moving up. So China and, and that Southern part of Siberia and Russia is probably also going to see some you know, weather impacts. But so we sort of took a look at that and we mapped all of that out. Um, and then again, as I said, law was starting to come into place. And I know that probably bores all of you. I'm a lawyer. I love the law. I'm still fascinated by it. Um, but this was all of these things that were coming into place. And so local jurisdictions were having to, um, you know, grapple with what does resiliency mean? Uh, you know, and how do you think about resiliency? I mean, there are so many multiple facets. I would argue that clearly in the community that Anthony was talking about, we have lost some resiliency um, in terms of how you slice and dice that word. Um, so that sort of served into the background for us. Um, and then Federal Highway has a vulnerability assessment index. So if this is something you're interested in, you can find it on their website. Um, so there is metrics out there that you can look at and sort of thinking about these integrated decision-making processes and feedback loops in this. And so these were some of our sort of big fat guiding questions, you know, um, looking at this at the mega regional scale. So we were scaling up from where you would, you know, traditionally be looking at data. Um, and, you know, how is a mega region resilient? What does that mean? And we had also been looking at that in the class that Ming did earlier on this year where we went to visit with the UK 2070 Commission. So thinking about spatial equity and thinking about what does that mean, but at the, you know, the much bigger regional level. So not thinking like just the Austin region, thinking about the triangle, thinking about the Northeast corridor, thinking about Cascadia. So it's a bigger spatial scale to get your head around and then to go and hunt for how then if you can find data, how do you integrate that data at that level and how, how does that work from a robust perspective that you can draw fundamental conclusions. 
Um, and again, we were looking at this, what are the MPOs doing at the whole time? Because the MPOs are kind of like the building blocks that link into the system, sort of as, they're almost the lowest point of the chain. I know there are cities and counties underneath, but from a transportation perspective, all plans spring from the MPO, then the state DOT, then US DOT and FHWA and FTA and FRA, FAA, you know, many agencies. So sort of thinking it in, in that way. Um, and why, why would we be worried about resilience for a mega region? Well, like in most things, it's, it's economic competitiveness and driving our economy. Um, and jobs, all of you want jobs. Um, all of us want to have a house and have a car and be able to have some economic prosperity. And for some of us who have student loans, pay off your student loans. I mean, just the key Maslow's hierarchy of needs within our lives that we all need. Um, and also too, maybe along the way, pulling up low income communities, giving them further opportunities, especially in this globalized economy and in an economy that is seeing disruptive technologies change the way we think about work with the gig economy and the way the gig economy is playing out. Um, so that sort of drove into movement of people, movement and goods. And then we also really looked at when you're looking at these big storms and other major disaster events that are occurring, how quickly can people get back to their regular life? First thing is how quickly can you get back to work? Then how can you get your kids to school? And one of our competitor, um, uni uh, I'm sorry, our our collaborative universities in this, Texas Southern, they were really have been looking at after the big storms that happened in Houston and the hurricanes and that, even as simple as your house is flooded, you've moved away. You're not now in your school district for your kids and you're at a critical juncture in the kids' development. What school are they gonna go to? And then they've got to find all new friends. And sometimes that's a huge commute now that people have got to get to and, and maybe they were not as mobile in terms of their options of the, their vehicle, for example. They could have an older vehicle. They maybe previously didn't have even a car. So sort of all of these things coming into play were what we were thinking of. And so the first thing in research I have been learning, and these last couple of years has really taught me, you have to be agile and nimble when you're thinking about this stuff, because things you thought you were going to be able to find, they don't exist. Data you thought that was going to be like that, pfft. It doesn't exist. So that was a real thing for us, which was finding data was hard. Even finding data from economic websites to tell you how to measure resilience is hard to find. And even the measuring of the impacts post these storms, you get these wildly differing numbers that are cited. But actually finding and drilling back down you know, into the spreadsheet that tells you how to do this, we struggled with. And Roxanne spent a whole semester as, and she was doing an undergraduate in finance, and it was driving her crazy as a business major <laughs> that she couldn't find this data. And she went, she's working at Ernst & Young now at an accounting firm and a consulting firm, but it was, that was just, it was so frustrating for her. And so we had many meetings in which we aired our frustration at not being able to find data. Um, and then finding the impact of transportation, it's really hard actually to, to disaggregate the data out on the impacts, and then it's hard to actually if you find that, how do you aggregate it back up to the mega region scale? It's easy to maybe aggregate it back into your local city scale or, or a sub region scale, but the mega region scale is a really um, a different enterprise. Um, we did also find though that there were federal grants coming down as a consequence of adding these components into our various highway transportation bills that, which essentially those are what fund our network and our system and drive the plans. And so there were lots of pilot small pilot programs going on with cities and counties that were happening at Federal Highway and the US DOT was supporting. Um, and so we ended up deciding there's really nothing out there for the mega region level. So we're gonna make this project be like a foundational project to set the scene to move forward and that further other people can now take some of the stuff we've created and enhance it and grow it <laughs> and make it work in a different way. So I would say that last bullet point is also a humbling thing in that sometimes you have some great ideas, but sometimes you have to reset, but it's really okay. And that's the great thing about, just something to tell you, I'm gonna pitch to you, these UTC grants, is it gives us that freedom to have these kind of moments, which are very disappointing for us as researchers, when you think you're gonna have this wonderful thing. And, but with the fact that we have this freedom with these grants to be able to do this and say, okay, we're gonna come back and we're gonna scale it back 
you've got to start from scratch. I love having that in a way we, that we had that and being through that process, even though it was pull your hair out moment, etc. So we, this is what we decided to do. So transportation and resilience, those are going to be our key words. And then we're going to find as much data as we can, start to explore this concept of spatial resilience in the mega regions. And then we decided for every US mega region, we're going to create a set of these three page papers that discuss what are the major types of disasters and from a weather related perspective that are occurring in these areas. So, you know, what's gone on, what have they been, what's been the duration, the longevity and how many, the money around this, and then what has been their impact on transportation, where we can find the data, putting some of that into the sort of, I call them informational papers. And then lastly, looking at where the MPOs, as this project did have MPO in it, so we were trying to tie it back to doing that. So that's where we ended up, from this grandiose thing of where I think we thought we were, which we didn't end up being. <laughs> so um, for the spatial resilience, we really focused in here, and we looked at <clears throat> um, the mega regions here in Texas and in Florida. And so we looked at specific hurricane seasons going back a few years, but there's data out there on that now. So at least it's something you can go and find and it's been, and it's been documented. Um, and again, so we, we looked at some of these kind of components. So what were the population impacts pre and post? Um, and then the you know, employment level impacts, where are we seeing significant degradation um, within those? And so here in Texas, we only had a few, pop, um, few counties um, in the triangle that really saw an overall de decrease in, in their um, employment. So, and then on the, on the population side, again, only a few counties that actually lost, lost net people. So that says to you that there is resiliency in the system that we were able to bounce back. So I think from that perspective, it's, I think this is a useful tool for people to start looking at. Um, and hopefully over time there can be more comparators done. Um, on the Gulf Coast, I will say a lot of the counties on the Gulf Coast haven't recovered. Um, and hurricanes, you know, Katrina and Rita were just so absolutely devastating. Um, and also, too, again here you've got, as you were saying earlier, everything's at low-lying sea level. So some people just choose not to come back. They don't want to rebuild again. Some people couldn't get FEMA grants anyway, loans to rebuild, so they may just be eventually priced up because they can't participate in some of the federal grants, et cetera, that are available. So um, other pieces of data when we looked at Southern Florida. So again, we looked at the same things, the population impacts and the total employment, and we looked at the changes before and post um, here. So again, some, were, some places were negative, but some not so much. So, um, and in here we sort of said in, in terms of population by 2017, when we were comparing the data up to 2017, two out of three counties had recovered. Um, and then on the employment side, it was about eight out of 10. So it was pretty robust and you might say resilient bounce back metrics here um, on this front. So, in the meanwhile, the great feds are, I like the federal government, just so you know, so you do some good stuff. Um, yeah, take a bow. <laughs> so, um, but you've really been putting money on the table on funding these different pilot programs. And again, if you just Google this, you can find lots of case studies on Federal Highway's website um, and USDOT's website. So they've done an awful lot of things. So in some of these, they were led at the state DOT level in state, some were led by USDOT Federal Highway, and then there were a few that were done within the MPOs, which you see the little green triangles. Um, so that was heartening for us that we're starting, you know, and that this is happening. But again, this is being done at the individual project site specific level. It's not being done thinking of it from a mega region perspective. So this is sort of how some of these three pages you're going to see coming out from us. So there's a map that are coming up on them. Um, and we did this for the 11 mega regions. And we're using federal highways definitions of mega regions. So we're staying in the pocket, so to speak. Less confusion than using some of the different criteria, et cetera. 
So again, we highlighted the most common threats. Um, and then we developed maps to show the population centers. And then where the MPOs had done work, we've gone in and identified that within it with like very brief snapshots of what they did. Um, so, and the idea with this is to combine all of this so it creates a resource for future, for future research at the mega region level. Again, a lot of this has been done at, at the, like I said, at the local base level, but aggregating it up and thinking about this from a mega region perspective, as usual, CM squared is trailblazing out there on so many things like we do. So we're the first. So we may get critiques, that's okay. Um, We've got tough shoulders, Ming, haven't we? But we really are trailblazing out there and doing some cool stuff that no one else has yet done. So on the mega region front. So this was the Cascadia one, just to give you an idea. And that's the end of my presentation. And hopefully I'm on time, right? I did this on the phone with Paulina yesterday and she was timing me and she had this talk that was going tick tock, tick tock as it was counting down. It was really funny, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Paulina is working for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey in, they have essentially a two year, what they call fellows program. So it's very competitive to get in. And I think they bring in, thir they've brought in, I want to say 15. I think one of the students from Penn is also there. Um, so, and you spend two years, so it's like a management training program, essentially. Um, and so you go in different departments. So she started off in her first rotation, she's in the department that does um, finance. Um, and so she's actually based at down by World Trade Center headquarters. That's in that area. Um, I think her next rotation, she said she's looking to maybe go into the um, their section that deals with all sort of all their environmental reviews and environmental work. Um, but she said she's loving it. So so they live on the one side of Central Park. So and they're in a brownstone. And the brownstone's owned by one family, and then they're in a little a tiny apartment in there. So they sold their house here. They've totally downsized. And then her husband has found a job. Josh found a job pretty fast, actually. So he's in real estate development. And his offices are on the south side of Central Park. So he walks through Central Park every morning. He has a five-minute commute. And I just said to her yesterday, like, I'm sick with jealousy. Like, <laughs> sick with jealousy. Could you imagine? walking through Central Park every morning to get to your job. No car, no bus, no subway. Or, or having daily dates in Central Park. I know, I know, it. can you imagine? But anyway, so, but, so thus far, it's going well. So this hopefully bodes well for you guys as our CM2 grads. There are jobs out there awaiting you and no, that will be good. Yes, Paulina and me, and then Rox. Is going to, is going to no, we're not. We, we just did it as a one year project, so we're not extending. So, I know. When was it completed? So, now I guess you could say we're still, we're still working on okay. it. So, but probably the bulk of the research was, was done by about July. And then we down tools and wrote papers for TRB. So with another former student, Stephanie, who was here the year before, who works at the MPO in Chicago. So it's been pretty crazy. So through the summer getting that done. So, but now the draft is almost ready. And so Roxanne's right now having a quick read through and then it'll come to me. Mm -hmm. I think we got. Yeah. I think we just really got hooked onto that when we were in the UK. I mean, more than anything. Yeah, on spatial planning. So I think it just we 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 brought the religion, so to speak. So it's not so much when you read it through the report. We've changed some of the terminology a little bit and we'll probably continue to work on that. But it's really sort of stuck in our minds, sort of thinking at it. I think just to mega regions are actually quite a hard concept to kind of explain to people in some instances. So sometimes talking about them from a sort of a spatial perspective, most of us have grown up looking at maps. And so I think if you can target it in that language, it helps from that perspective. And speaking as a lawyer, language is really important. So 
finding those connective hooks is really, really critical for, you know, bringing people up to the next level and for also for future research to move out to tell more of the story because I kind of feel the mega region story still has to be effectively told and sold mm -hmm. from a perspective. And federal, it's probably those definitions, like it is. Like using the federal highway definitions to help make it more crystallized. Yes, even though I don't necessarily personally agree <laughs> with how they're delineated because the Northeast mega region kind of has got split up and I feel it loses some oomph because it's been split up. That's not a technical term, just so you know, to say it's lost some oomph. But I feel, but, so, but that's how I, I, yeah, but that's how I feel about it. So, and I, and I, and I'm, but one hopes too that over time we're gonna go back and that's something I'm gonna be doing this year is sort of looking at is, does the Texas Triangle still exist or have we really, has, is it changing shape? And we, so, and where, and also where we're living because the state is changing because fracking has changed the dynamic coming, going west of us here. Mm -hmm. And then the valley is growing. Mm -hmm. And we did work for, for TechStop 2012, I think that was, I mean, that work, because you were on that project when Donovan worked for us. Right. Yeah, so 2012. And we did a workshop in Houston with a ton of freight companies. And they actually said we should, it shouldn't be the triangle, we should call it the diamond. And it should run from the Dallas-Fort Worth area down to Laredo, down to Brownsville, back up across Corpus, up to the Houston-Beaumont area, and then back up to DFW. And so it would be a very, an odd shaped diamond, but a diamond. So, and then there was one person there who was from El Paso and said, no, it should be the star you should have a ribbon that goes out to El Paso. Now, if you speak to John Love III, who's the head of the MPO in Midland Odessa, he'd probably tell you it's a star too, because Midland Odessa has just grown, shot up. So, and he's experiencing challenges that he never thought he'd be experiencing as an MPO director. So, so that's part of what we're going to do, sort of looking at in, in this year's project, looking at that, so. So we should maybe go, I thought, I'm sure we looked at Comptroller data, so. It was very recent. Okay. I'm going to go look at that now. Okay. Thank you. No Can I unplug? Yes, go for it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's just thing to make a case. But in this case, we did it. So I wonder if to uh, either use the data or some sort of uh, argument to, to illustrate, to demonstrate the interstate, inter MPO, inter intercounty, or inter MPO dependent one mm. natural disasters and natural hurricanes. That's one thought. And then another one, uh, I remember doing it. Katrina and uh, my friends, uh, including, including Dr. Penn from PSU and yeah. Simon and all evacuated, evacuated from Houston and my, my place. So that's temporary. I heard there are many people, uh, many uh, families, they escaped from that area to Texas. But at the end, they decided not to. Mm -hmm. Leave, they just stay in Texas. So if we could find data yeah. showing that kind of, my owner is a bit of a five year migration data from census time. Yeah. If that so can show some numbers yeah. of the, during that specific time period, people migrate or their natural migration happen. For that geography, the area, they mm -hmm. might be hypothesized. Extra migration, particularly from one country to another. Right now, uh, Paulina showed us that like, uh, during that time period, maybe 05 or 06, uh, losing population or gaining population, and then afterward. Yeah. I think she also had a, a, the next portion of this data showing that uh, how many years 
Yes. They come to, to recover, recover to the <coughs> uh, population again to the level as the same as before, as yeah. the, the pre disaster. So you using that as yeah. a measure of uh, resilience, the number of years taken to recover. So. Uh, yeah, she did. She ran. She did ten and fifteen year. I think it was some of them. It ran up up to almost a fifteen year through the data. So the max are comparing from before to twenty seventeen. So in that, I, the other. I mean, the other thing we even just discussed amongst our team is, were we more resilient because we were in a mega region and because there's other opportunities because we're sitting in a mega region and we have access to good roads, you know, we have access, or our, I would say our mobility is better because we're in the mega region and, and because there's so much cross connectivity and because there's other economic opportunities that maybe, you know, I'm an expert here, but I can still go there and work there as an expert in that chosen field. So there was that question, but then we were like, but Louisiana was in the Gulf Coast mega region. So therefore does the Gulf Coast mega region, is it a mega region? in the way we're thinking of a mega region, or is it a different type of mega region, which is why there's less resiliency. So, and then we got onto, we need to have a sociologist and an anthropologist working with us to think this all through, because there are more questions that are beyond our technical expertise when you're looking at this. But I think that's the beauty of being in this sort of multidisciplinary space as well. If we all think about things from a, a different lens, you know, we ask different questions, and so that's useful from that perspective. But Again, I, I am going to go look at that comp trailer's data because I want to see how good that is in aggregating that data up at a mega region level. Because uh, we definitely discussed it all in the report as far as like the Remy model. It looked at the impact of Katrina, how everyone moved to Houston and down, mm -hmm. and how it impacted those communities almost for a little bit for the better because it made a lot of more people. And then they were yeah. easily able to absorb that all yeah. at the same point in time. And then the economic impact kind of went up because it had a lot of people to be productive yep. at the same point in time. And then when they're not leaving, they kept going. Um, there's also, since the diversity within our so-called Golden Triangle is not really dependent so much on one industry. Yeah. You know, there's, you can go to Houston and you can stuff with oil and gas and you get the balance a lot more intellectual properties in uh, Austin mm -hmm. that it spreads out and that it's able to rebound a little bit quicker than any other mega region that doesn't have that diversity within itself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was something interesting that I learned and then yeah. it also went along with some policy Yeah, yeah. So, so the Remy model is just the Remy model does have some flaws. So one of our former researchers, CTR, David Luskin, who's a transportation economist, he will pick apart Remy until you want to cry. So and he works at USDOT now, so in, in DC. But David, will, he is not a fan of Remy. And the thing with all these models is Remy costs a bomb to buy. So yeah, you might be able to do great analysis, but I don't. Ming's not going to give me $150,000 to buy Remy and have it essentially basically tailored to the region I'm studying. I wish he did, but he doesn't. So <laughs> uh, we, we our school about uh, imprint. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a mini version of the Remy. Yeah. We can uh, input output. Remy basically yeah. input, input output, output. modeling package. Uh, we're only actually in a potential comparison. Yeah. Uh, actually what it's custom does is not the software itself, but data. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. They sell data by county. I mean, this uh, county, okay, how much? Yeah. Uh, 3,000, uh, 3, Okay, that's count, how many counties? 254 yeah. counties in Texas. Yeah. How much? Yeah. They definitely own. In this case, we also need uh, Louisiana. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. They had scaled it down to just Texas. Yeah. Right. The controller should have that information posted by now because it was back in July when I was with him. Uh, so that would be something. Yeah. Because I know we, we looked at every comp trailer's website in all of the different places. There were, there, when we were looking, there wasn't. So now that maybe there is. So. Let me go through my, my cards. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Um, clap again. Yeah. <laughs>